I'm delighted to welcome you back to the economy and future of work stage. This morning, we've got a really exciting panel in store from the Institute for the Future of Work, the co-sponsor of this stage. They're going to be talking about the big acceleration that we've all seen take place over the last couple of weeks as we've shifted towards home working, dependence on platforms like these to do conferences, and how technology through COVID-19 has rapidly transformed and changed. I expect that people will have lots of questions to ask our fascinating panelists. So please do use the Slido link, which is available to you on the COGX platform, and also tweet about the event if you can. Use the Inter Institute for the Future of Work's Twitter handle at, at underscore future of work and the COGX Twitter handle at, at COGX2020. I'm now going to hand over to Anna Thomas, Director of the Institute for the Future of Work, to introduce our panel. Thank you, Nash. Um, I'm really excited to be introducing and moderating this amazing panel on what we think is perhaps the most topical and important issue. We're looking at uh, the big acceleration, what's happening to technology and technology adoption through COVID-19. COVID has hit us at a point when we're already in the middle of one of the greatest technological transformations since industrialization. And we've begun to see acceleration in the youth an application of a range of technologies in a range, for a range of reasons. This panel is going to dig down into this trend and look at what they think is being increased. Is it traditional automation in response to new restrictions on human contact? Is it data analytics and emotional AI um, to see how we're all coping? Or is it just simple scheduling or access apps? So I'm going to be asking the panel to do short presentations for five minutes each and then have a discussion on, first of all, what's accelerating? Secondly, what are the implications of that? Is it also accelerating inequality um, or techno solutionism? And thirdly, what can we do about it? Um, if automation is accelerating, how can we accelerate a more human centred approach to the use of technology? Um, my first uh, speaker is Professor Sir Pisarades, um, who's co-chair of the Institute for the Future of Work and he's a professor at the London School of Economics. He's done many things, the list is too long, but among others, he's a Nobel laureate um, uh, for, and his Nobel Prize in 2010 uh, was in economics for his work on technology, on labour market frictions and on employment. So that seems particularly handy now. He's also a fellow of the British Academy, the European Economic Association and many other things. Can I hand over now to Chris, please, um, to speak on the technological acceleration? Good morning. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and uh, my topic today is about technology and jobs, uh, what's happening in the jobs market uh, with technology. A brief two-minute introduction on what was happening before COVID and then some comments about the impact that COVID is having on, uh, on that. Now, in the last couple of decades, maybe even more, we've seen uh, jobs being replaced by machines uh, that do things better than us. The list of tasks that machines can do it's rather limited at present, but it's growing. And the main uh, concern is that there's uncertainty about what they will do in the future. And are they going, eventually, are they going to do just about everything we can do? And therefore, there will be no jobs left uh, for us to do. Now, I have to say that I haven't been very concerned about that, not as concerned as some other uh, economists uh, writing about it, partly because uh, the working population is falling. Uh, we work fewer and fewer hours and take more time off in the form of leisure. As the great John Maynard Keynes said, we could be working 15 hours a week. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and also, quite significantly when it comes to COVID, because uh, we have been very good at creating new jobs in um, sectors of the economy that uh, machines cannot uh, perform very well. Now, those sectors have been mainly involved in human interaction. Uh, the main uh, gainers, if you like, from that uh, job creation have been uh, the health and care sector, the hospitality sector, travel, uh, retail trade, personal service, all kinds of domestic services, uh, people coming uh, to your home to help uh, you know, childcare or people care. 
uh, dog care, you know, just about anything you can think of that involves a, a, a personal touch. Whereas the main losers have been manufacturing data processing jobs, the more sort of boring jobs, if you like, the ones that you can do uh, without uh, meeting other people. Now, the problem with COVID is that it's attacked precisely the jobs that we've been creating to um, uh, take over from um, the jobs that machines uh, are doing. Uh, so is this process of job creation the, the more optimistic scenario, if you like, about technology and jobs? It, it, is it ending? Well, the answer, of course, is that we don't know because we depend very much on the medical people. You know, if a vaccine develops, then everything uh, might change. But with the uh, as COVID proceeds in this process, I'm, I'm getting more and more concerned and listening to all the medical events taking place in the media. Uh, you know, the people who know much more about epidemiology than economists do for sure. Um, I'm getting more concerned because they're saying that even if we deal with COVID, there will be uh, more COVID uh, in, in the future uh, now that they're beginning to understand uh, where uh, this particular virus came from. And um, so some of the processes we're seeing now might um, actually stay with us for a long time. Uh, so what are they? Well, I'll summarize them under three subheadings. Number one, automation is moving faster. Some uh, uh, information is beginning to emerge from business bosses that uh, automation that they were going to do over the next uh, five to 10 years, they are accelerating as much as possible, and they could be doing it within the next uh, few months. So prepare for more job loss. That's the pessimistic scenario. But maybe for more productivity rise and, and wage rises for those who are lucky enough to stay in work. That's the more optimistic side of it. Second, um, even, if, even if COVID and concerns about future viruses don't put an end to the job creation process that I mentioned before, the one that involves direct contact with people, uh, it will slow it down. Uh, no company would now jump into providing personal services of some kind or open another new restaurant or whatever, or uh, preparing new travel, uh, for new types of holidays, they won't do it immediately. The, the process will slow down. Now, that I can only see as a pessimistic scenario. I don't quite honestly say, see, see anything very optimistic about that because that's the way we spend our leisure. And if we are going to have more time off, we're going to have fewer interesting things to do in that time. And therefore, we could be um, facing um, rather more unemployment, more structural unemployment as we go along as people are making the, the, the transition. Um, and finally, number three, uh, there are changes in um, work arrangements that are taking place. And this is what you are seeing now, you know, COGEX last year, I'm sure it was somewhere in King's Cross, I think, live. Now <clears throat> you're seeing us all on screen. Um, <clears throat> the most obvious one, other than what you're seeing now, is um, what affected all of us, the home deliveries. Uh, food, anything we want to buy. Uh, and that kind of changing work arrangements, uh, I think, is here to stay. We have experience of that in the way work is organized from uh, SARS in um, East Asia, and in particular from countries that uh, took it more seriously, like South Korea and Hong Kong, where there was a sudden change in work arrangements there you know, deliveries being the main one, online shopping, for example, that stayed forever. And that explains, in fact, to some extent, why countries like South Korea and um, uh, Hong Kong, China, uh, not as much as, not so much the mainland, more, more um, in Hong Kong, it, it explains why now they are so much more advanced, uh, both in dealing with COVID, but also in... Um, uh, providing all the facilities uh, online, your home deliveries. Uh, they were so much quicker with uh, face masks, for example, whereas as in the UK, first we said no, then we said maybe, then some people. Uh, now everyone who travels, and I'm sure sooner or later, as a Chinese friend was telling me, is that all the fashion houses will now start designing face masks with nice things there, and it's going to become 
a new fashion accessory, you know, look at my hat, look at my shirt, look at my face mask, that kind of thing. I, I, I leave you there. But remember those three things. Those are the three things that I think uh, we, we need to think more about. And I hope there are some questions about them too. Thank you very much for my five, ten minutes of glory. I don't know how many we were. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you so much, Chris. Um, I'm keen to see what Jackie does next and how much, uh, how many common threads there are between you. Um, can I now introduce Jackie O'Reilly, Professor Jackie O'Reilly, who's the founder and co-director of a fantastic new uh, academic centre um, of ESRC funded, the Digital Futures of Work Centre based at the University of Sussex called Digit. Um, Jackie's also got expertise in a huge <coughs> areas, but particular expertise on youth labour and youth unemployment, which again seems particularly important now. Um, Jackie, can I hand over to you please um, for your presentation? Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me and being such an eminent uh, distinguished circles. Uh, we had a very nice set of slides to show you because I thought you might like to look at some <coughs> rather than look at uh, my spare room. But unfortunately, the technology didn't quite work. But never mind. Anyway, there was a couple of points I wanted to make. What are the characteristics of the recent uh, period of COVID? And I would argue there's about four of how acceleration has happened. One, frenzied. Two, erratic. Three, very unequal. And fourth, very creative. So some of the partners we've had who've worked with us at the Digit Centre are uh, some large retail organisations in North America and we've seen that they've employed over 330,000 new employees in the past two months to meet the consumer demand for in shopping. We have another very major law firm who's working with our centre and they moved 5,000 workers out of their central London offices in a week and they all went home. I unfortunately through COVID had to register the death of my uncle and had to get in contact with London uh, Council and in speaking to them through that I found that the council workers were no longer in their offices in London but dispersed at home but they'd all been given encrypted phones and encrypted computers so they could issue all of the legal certificates I required. We've also seen um, uh, e-commerce has moved, increased by 300% in the past two months. So there has been a really frenzied level of activity that is actually quite extraordinary. The second thing I wanted to talk about in this level of frenzy is also that when we talk about acceleration, we're not, it's not one tsunami coming across everybody at the same time, but it's actually quite erratic. And I think we also have to think about uh, we don't have suffered some kind of comatose since uh, the 23rd of March when we shut down. Let's remember what it was like before that. And some of the work we've been doing looking at um, how technological adoption across the European Union and internationally varies by countries. But what we find, for example, is um, if we look at the European Union Digital Economy and Society Index COOP, that tries to compare the digital take up of different European countries. And there are a number of different measures they have, but let's just look at one, which is the adoption of digital technology by companies. So what we find there in 2018, the UK was about 14th in Europe. So it was hovering around the middle in terms of how effectively companies in the UK were adopting technology. By 2019, it had moved up to seventh. Congratulations, really good. And the Definition was in terms of people who become companies who are using e-commerce or using digital technologies, for example, to manage uh, recruitment, accountancy, customer relations bases, etc. But the number one country in Europe in 2019, and there's no unconscious bias here, it's just fact, uh, Ireland. Ireland was the number one country who's had businesses adopting digital technology. And this is a really interesting question, why Ireland? Especially given this is a, a country that had was really hit by the financial crisis in more than 10 years ago, roughly 10 years ago. Um, 
But countries like Germany, for example, are still hovering around the middle. Countries like Italy are right at the back. What's the point is that the adoption of these technologies is really varied across the European Union. We shouldn't forget that. And secondly, there's the um, if we also look at how this adoption is happening in the UK, we see really quite significant gaps between what's happening in different regions of the UK. And this will affect how these the effect of COVID pans out in the long term in terms of what regions have an ecosystem that will sustain economic growth and what regions will be really quite left behind because of a range of different types of inequalities. So the third point I want to make about acceleration, it's being very, very unequal. So we've heard consistently the virus doesn't discriminate, but actually we know it does because it depends where you live. What I had a very nice cartoon I wanted to share with you sent to me from some colleagues in Belgium that shows who has been able to stay at home, who goes to work and what kind of conditions they are. Anyway, one of the key points I want to make about the unequal effects of acceleration are a concept we're working on about household digital density. So it's taking from the international country comparisons and transporting at the micro level to what's happening in households. So what we want to argue is looking not just at what happens to individuals in the labour market, but looking at what happens to individuals who live in different family circumstances and how the circumstances of the people they live with also affect affects their labour market opportunities. And we've seen one thing that's discussed in terms of research more in the United States <clears throat> and in the UK is only discussed really on the news. And there are things like the homework gap. So what kinds of children benefit from having a very high digital density in their household with highly educated uh, parents who will support them with their homework with all the tech they need? And what happens to the kids who don't have any of that stuff? And we know from research in America, it's people living in rental accommodation or low status rental accommodation with low levels of education, whose only connection to the internet is through their phone. They have no uh, computers at home, they have no servers at home, they haven't even got tables to have their dinner off. So the types of how you do your homework really will affect that levels of acceleration. And one of the issues is about whether we're having a polarisation or is it more complicated than that? We're actually having a really fragmentation of work. So there are some people who can stay at home and work in nice conditions, like ourselves. There are other people who are on the streets and there are other people who've got nothing to do. And there has been a rapid intensification. And I'm going to be quiet. And the fourth point I wanted to make was about how acceleration has been really creative. So we had the opportunity to go to the United States to do a whole load of research interns this summer. And when Mr. Trump shut us all down, I kind of said, OK, tant pis, hein? you know, we're not going. And this organisation said, let's think creatively about this. So they have actually managed to set up 145 internships remotely for their organization. The question is, why would they do this? In fact, I actually thought some of them were more creative than us wonderful, open-minded academics, um, because they have a pipeline of young people they want to recruit. Secondly, we have to be creative in thinking about new ways to do research, whether we do research through these internet type of uh, interviews, or whether we have to look for new types of data. There is but on one hand, it's brilliant in terms of opening up your imagination of what you can do. I have one or two other last points to say. There was one that's frenzied, erratic, unequal and creative. Secondly, the point Anna made at the beginning. If we're talking about acceleration, what type of technology we're talking about? Is it high end robots and really sophisticated uh, types of tech data analysis there? Or are we talking about the types of it low entry low cost, easy access apps that my window cleaner, for example, showed to me how he uses it to schedule his, his uh, the way he delivers his window cleaning, how he manages his accounts, etc. So we really need to differentiate between what types of tech and the question that all organisations are going to be asking is exactly the same kind of question we've been asking ourselves for the past two and a half months. What is necessary? And do I really have to do this? Is it essential for me to go to the shop, to go on a car ride, to test my eyesight? Are these things really essential? But organisations are going to be asking themselves 
what is really essential and necessary? What are our essential products and services? What facilities do we need to deliver those services? Do we need our big swanky offices in central London that cost a lot of money if we can actually contact all our workers remotely? And then what networkers are we going to need? And these are the kind of real key questions that we have. And the very last point, and then I'll be quiet, what can be done? This is also, it's, like, it's not a new question, is it? Because we've been through loads of financial crises and um, unemployment crises. And where do we go to find answers to try and work out what to do? OK, we've got a whole lot of economists here. Let's take the economic framework. One side you can go to is supply side training. One of the challenges we face in the UK is the very fragmented, marketized way training is provided. And one of the key issues of really brilliant organisations, for example, in the United States, uh, Year Up is a great organisation that really gets people from low skilled up into tech jobs. Or here also colleagues we work with at Youth Employment UK, LJ Rowling. They do great ways of trying to bring digital skills for young people. But the issue is how do we scale those up and how do those become universally adopted? Secondly, how do you get employers to incentivise them to keep staff? So we've had the job retention scheme. How long is that going to last? We've had previously experiences with the apprenticeship levy that didn't really work as effectively intended. We need to go back and look at that and say, why didn't it work? Why were employers willing to pay a tax on it? rather than actually employ people. We have the European Union Youth Guarantee. It didn't really actually guarantee a lot of things. The half of the young people that applied for it didn't get anything. And the third element of where we see job growth is actually in consumer behaviour. So going back to the example of the uh, re retailers who employed 300,000 people in the past two months, they did that because people went on a bin shopping. And those patterns of consumption are really the things that are going to affect who is going to get kind of what jobs in the future. Sorry if I take more than my five minutes. No slides, but there you go. Thank you. Only, only a little bit. Thank you, Jackie. That was fantastic. And I, talking about creativity, I really enjoyed the creative way in which you describe some of the trends, frenzied activity and erratic introduction of technology. I'm going to um, bring Daniel on as soon um, as I can. Uh, Daniel is a fellow in economics at Balliol um, and the author of two best-selling books, First, the future of the profession, which I, in fact, gave to Chris um, in the course of the work commission some years ago. And secondly, this one, a world without work, if there's anyone that hasn't got it. Um, so without further ado, um, Daniel, can I hand over to you, please? Thank you very much for that uh, warm introduction. Great pleasure to be with everyone this morning. What, what I want to do in the next few minutes is just two things. Uh, the first is, I want to say a little about that book that Hannah, uh, Anna held up uh, and, and why the ideas are really important for what's taking place at the moment. Uh, and then secondly, I want to share some reflections on looking ahead, what I think the medium term is likely to look like. So every day we hear stories of systems and machines taking on tasks we thought only human beings alone could ever do, uh, making medical diagnoses, uh, driving cars, drafting legal documents, composing music, designing beautiful buildings, writing news reports. What does all of this mean for the vast majority of us for whom our job is our main source of income? Uh, I wrote A World Without Work because this really is, I think, one of the greatest questions of our time. Uh, and we're not taking seriously enough the threat of a future where there's not enough well-paid work for everyone to do because of the advances uh, in these new technologies. Now, I'm not saying that there's going to be some big technological big bang in the next few years, after which lots of people wake up and find themselves suddenly without a job. I don't think that's going to happen. Work is going to remain for some time to come. But what I do worry about, and this is what I worry about in that book, is that as we move through the 21st century, more and more people might find that they're unable to make the sorts of economic contributions to society that they might have hoped or expected to make in the 20th century. And even a world like this, without some big bang, it seemed to me, would still undermine the way that we live together. It creates three big challenges, in my view. 
And that book is all about those challenges and how we should respond to them. And I thought there were three challenges. One is the economic challenge. How do we share out material prosperity in society when our traditional way of doing so, paying people for the work that they do, is less effective than it might have been in the past? The second challenge is about power, what we do about the growing power of, in particular, large technology companies who are responsible for developing these technologies in the first place. And the third challenge is very little, I think, to do with economics at all, and it's the challenge of meaning and purpose. How do we provide meaning and purpose in people's lives when work is no longer at the center of their lives? And so the book, A World Without Work, was all about these challenges and how we ought to respond to them. What I find so striking about COVID-19 and the pandemic we currently find ourselves in is that these three challenges that I thought we'd face with mounting severity as we moved through the 21st century, we now face right now uh, because of this virus. We find ourselves in a world with less work, not because robots have taken all the jobs, but because this virus has just completely decimated the demand that so many of those jobs rely upon. And if you think about those three challenges, they're the challenges that we face right now. The challenge of inequality, how do we share out prosperity in society when we can't rely upon the labor market to do it as effectively as it might have done in the past? Then there's the challenge of power. A very conspicuous feature of the economic environment at the moment is that a few large technology companies are doing extremely well, and yet many of the small businesses that provide the backbone of our economic lives are struggling. And thirdly, the challenge of meaning. It's been quite interesting seeing how much has been written in the last few weeks about how we ought to best spend our time in this sort of enforced idleness. I think many of us have a very good sense of what gainful employment looks like. I think it's become quite clear, though, many of us don't have a good sense of what gainful unemployment looks like. So these challenges, I think, we face right now. What does the world of, look like, uh, world of work look like in the medium term? Looking further ahead, I can see, I think, two possible broad futures. But in both of these futures, in my view, there's no going back to the pre-COVID-19 world of work. It seems to me that that world is gone. The first future we can think of as being the vaccine future. Here in 12 to 18 months, we find a vaccine or indeed an effective treatment. And that allows us to get a little closer to our pre-COVID-19 economic lives. But this isn't going to be a complete return to the pre-COVID-19 world. And the reason is this. One way to think about what's happening at the moment is that we're currently engaged in a sort of massive unplanned pilot scheme in the use of technology. Some things we're going to find out work quite well, but other things we're going to, uh, some things we're going to find out don't work well, but other things we are going to find out do work well. Uh, and many of these ways of working are likely to remain in embed. So take doctors, for instance. Last year, fewer than 1% of appointments uh, in England and Wales were done remotely. At the moment, about 93% of appointments are being done remotely. And most people are pretty happy with that service, it turns out. But I think there's also a second future, and this is what I call the no vaccine future. And this is a very different proposition. And it's here I worry about the acceleration of automation far more. The virus has created a very strong incentive to automate the work of human beings, and particularly those, as we've heard, that work in jobs that involve interpersonal interaction and the personal touch. A machine, after all, doesn't fall ill. It doesn't have to follow social distancing rules. It doesn't have to isolate to protect its, its fellow machines. And for now, this incentive is being almost completely suppressed by measures to encourage employers to keep their employees on their books. So the British government, for instance, is paying <coughs> up to 80% of uh, many people's wages, underwriting a huge part of the labor market. But once this state support is wound down, as inevitably it will be, then that incentive to replace people with machines, I worry, is going to be unleashed. And so long as we still don't have a vaccine or an effective treatment, it seems to me that that incentive is going to continue to strengthen. So in thinking about what lies ahead, 
in the medium term, I think we need to think very carefully about both of these futures. None of them will represent a return to our pre-COVID-19 economic lives. And in both of them, I see a critical role for technology, although for quite different reasons. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Daniel, and all of you um, for your presentations and your different perspectives um, on this topic. Um, I think given what you've all said, um, that in fact we are not moving into an era of mass technological unemployment, notwithstanding the catchy title of Daniel's uh, book. Um, I'd like to um, pull together what you've said by inviting you to focus on how the drivers of technology adoption have changed and how that has impacted or affected the experience or quality of work in your views. Are there any takers? Or shall I choose someone? First of all, could I, I may say something? I, I, I mean, I completely disagree with Daniel anyway, because I think it's the kind of lump of labour fallacy that assumes there's only a certain percentage of jobs or work to be done. And I think it ignores um, the kind of creativity of humankind along with lots of different types of technological change and how that generates jobs that we didn't even know we wanted done. Um, so, Jesse, how might that um, affect, in your view, the experience of work? What? Sorry, say that again, please. Um, so, in view of what you've described um, uh, about the acceleration of technology and the use of technology, what's your view about the main impacts on the kind of experience or quality of work? Me? You're asking yeah. about Daniel. I think it's really varied. It, for some people, I, mean, I think we also have to remember uh, we, don't, we haven't suffered from amnesia by having a pandemic. It's like we haven't forgotten everything that happened before because and suddenly it's going to be some kind of new world out there. You know, history has long run threads that reproduce themselves over time and those things will carry over into the next phase that we're going to. This period clearly what differentiates it from the financial crisis is that it has had a universal effect on everybody in the sense of shut down for comparable amounts of time, more or less, at the same time. Whereas the financial crisis affected people very differently, whether they were very wealthy or very poor. Um, how is it going to affect the future quality of jobs? There will be some jobs that will actually be really good. So, for example, some of the people that want to work with our centre from Scottish Enterprise, they're looking mm -hmm. at wanting to understand how AI could be used to create unmanned oil rigs and to remove dangerous hazardous jobs um, you could say in some ways those people will develop AI for uh, in the military to go and have robots to look to detect bombs and mines it's better to have a robot do that than a human being so they could be improving different parts of dangerous jobs we have on the other hand there's a lot of literature that talks about how this will in part of the trend of precariousness the falling levels of relative wages. Those are long-term trends that have been happening since the 80s or the 70s. Some of that technology will enable that to happen as well. They, the things coexisting at the same time, there's not just one thing or another thing. This is the, this coexisting is what we find. That's so Anna, it, can, I, can I jump in there? Yes, of course. Uh, um, so just, just to say on, on Jackie's... Um, uh, skepticism or disagreement about the argument that I I, I was developing there. M my book really takes that disagreement as its starting point. Uh, and, and for those who share that skepticism or um, uh, suspicion about uh, this argument that I've developed, I, I inc I'd encourage you to have a look at the book because I really am trying to explain why it is that I think this time is different. Um, but I want to put that to one side and just focus on this issue of job quality. I think one of the things that um, was unfortunate at times about the debate about the future of work before this pandemic began was that we tended to focus on the future of jobs. Jobs were our unit of analysis. How many jobs are going to be created? How many jobs are going to be destroyed? X or Y percent of jobs can be automated and so on. But something that started to happen uh, more recently 
was <laughs> that there was a renewed focus not just on the quantity of jobs but also the quality of jobs and the debate about the future of work and discussions about the future of work turned far more and i think usefully towards issues about pay and security and uh, flexibility and job satisfaction and things like that um and i think there has been in this uh, uh new crisis even more of a focus on the quality and the nature of work as well as the amount of work and i think that's uh i think that's a good thing and to the extent that we can keep that conversation going in the months to come and and hopefully as, this, as, we, as we get a grip on the but that's a conversation we've been having for absolute decades since the 1970s economic crisis of mass unemployment and the 1980s development of labor market flexibility we've constantly been discussing what the quality of work is about precarious employment atypical employment part-time work temporary work and now zero hour contracts it's not covid that's made this happen quicker these are long run debates. And one of the things I think we do have a capacity to act politically, the Labour government, when they introduced the national minimum wage in the UK in 1997, that made a really big change, predominantly to a lot of very low paid women workers. So we do have political capacity to act if we want to. The question is, do we want to and can we? Can I bring Chris into this conversation? I mean, in your view, Chris, um, is it right that these are just things that we've seen for a very long time, or are there new issues or new forms of polarisation or exacerbations in the different types of quality of work that we're seeing, as well as the number of jobs? Well, well, of course, we, we've been seeing forever the replacement of uh, workers by machines ever since the agricultural revolution. Um, and the industrial revolution, there's no doubt about um, the structural transformations that have been uh, taking place in our economies. And uh, admittedly, there has been an acceleration uh, since uh, digital technologies, computers, and all that uh, came into the uh, workplace in the 1980s. Uh, before then, in a way, it was fairly easy to see what made a good job you know, because so many jobs were in manufacturing about 40 percent of workers were going into manufacturing all you needed was to improve working conditions in manufacturing uh, have a good minimum wage and and that's it uh, now things are different because there is a lot more uncertainty uh, you need to have different skills that are changing all the time uh, you cannot uh, just learn one type of skill going to work and expect to stay there until the retirement Having said that, I, uh, I, I, I do agree with um, both previous speakers, actually, in the, in, 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 that, that they, they both made some very valuable points. The, um, I mean, I do think that um, human ingenuity in creating new, job, new jobs uh, is without limit. That if people want to think of jobs to do, I want to create them. They could go into self-employment. They can think of just about everything. I, I, I see people at the LSE. When uh, we, you talk to them now, what do you want to do? They all want to develop some kind of app for a mobile device. And um, it, it becomes uh, important and you are bought up by one of the big techs and then you move on to the next thing. You know, it's incredible how many of our students uh, want to do that. The, the problem now, the problem of good, of what's a good job now and rewarding with a future is, is a lot more difficult, in fact, to uh, define. And, and it's one of the reasons that the Institute for the Future of Work uh, exists. It's one of the reasons we founded the Institute two years ago, three maybe years ago, in fact, now, uh, is precisely to um, see what do we need to make um, a job to make jobs more attractive and we have to see that in the context of the aging population that we have the falling uh, uh, working uh, population and 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 i think we could do it i'm not as pessimistic as uh, as daniel uh, sounded at the end that, that, that that's it there is no limit to what machines can do maybe 100 years from now maybe 200 years but in the medium term in his own words I think the biggest, the biggest challenge for us is to see how we could um, uh, make work uh, more attractive, rather than 
uh, what do we do with the unemployed and, and how can we improve the quality of unemployment and things like universal basic income come in, uh, hours of work, uh, safety at work, uh, we, we could use robots in collaboration with human beings in uh, dangerous uh, occupations, uh, like Jackie was saying, there is an extremely large number of things we could be doing and that's what's, uh, uh, that's the biggest challenge we're facing at the Institute for the Future of Work as well. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Chris. I think that takes us on and in a sense takes us back to the next question, one of Zach, J uh, Jackie's points um, about how uh, the technological uh, introduction seemed frenzied. There was a frenzied approach to, the, to, to adoption and use of technology. Um, what is the risk, if it's frenzied, of us not doing it well, Chris, of us not doing what Chris said? Um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, introducing technology. Are there any increased risks, do you think, um, uh, with regard to the pace um, of some technological adoption, as you've all described? Can we start with Daniel, perhaps? Hmm. I mean, I, I just want to emphasise uh, the, the point that I don't think in either of those futures that we face, we face an acceleration of technology and some big bang where lots of people find themselves without work. I, I don't think that's likely to happen uh, in, in the medium term. But what I do worry about very much in the spirit of what Chris was saying was that as a consequence of this pandemic, we, we just, we've just we created a very strong incentive to automate precisely the sorts of work um, that we had that we had been hopeful was sort of protected from uh, automation, or not even to automate that work, just to have less of it or to do it very differently these sorts of jobs that involve uh, interpersonal tasks uh, um, and interpersonal communication. Uh, and, and that for me uh, is, is the worry, not some big technological bang, but the, the threat that more and more people in months and years to come are going to find that they're not able to make the economic contribution that they might have hoped to do in that particular part of the economy. Um, so it's not a kind of dramatic uh, uh, technological revolution. Um, but but I think for those people who who have to bear the brunt of it, it's still uh, a, a really consequential uh, consequential change. Um, so that that's that's what that's what worries that's what worries me, and and, and I I think that's uh, uh, something that worries Chris as well. With that, um, yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. If I could, if I could just some very very quick, I mean, the challenge has always been that work is in transition. How do you make workers go from one place to another? And as long as things are taking place at, uh, slowly, you could work out ways of doing it, you know, retraining, uh, lifelong learning, supporting workers during their employment. But you're absolutely right, Daniel, in that uh, what we're seeing now is an acceleration of one side of that equation, which is the side of uh, automation and, and replacing of, of workers. But we're seeing a slowing down of the other side of the equation, which is the job creation side, the human ingenuity going away because of all the uncertainties involved. And therefore, this question of transition is becoming much more difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that is a challenge that governments have to face. Government has a big role to play here. Jackie, do you want to come in there? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm a sociologist, so I see the world a bit different to economists, not quite so one side of the equation, the other side of the equation, or I can read equations. There have been job there has been job creation in this two month period. For example, look at all the jobs that have been created in some parts of retail. There has also been a lot of potential future job losses as well. It's just not it's not as simple as one side of the equation or the other. I just think it's more variegated and depends on which parts of the sectors you have. And what are the catalysts for creating jobs? In the 70s, we talked about government's investment would create jobs. And really, at the moment, what it seems like, governments can create jobs. For example, one of the policies is whether or not Boris and all his hospitals will be a new job creation way that Roosevelt stands were. Um, on the other side, I think one of the biggest risks that are coming out of um, the outcome of this period it will be a repetition of what came out of the financial crisis. If we talk about just simply in terms of supply side training, 
One of the problems we have in the UK is a real fragmentation and marketization of these forms of training that are constantly being rejuvenated so that nobody actually knows what is a valuable skill to have anymore. Everything is denigrated, including university degrees often. And that is a real problem of the UK system. And that will mean that the people that need the kinds of skills to move them to get these jobs won't know which skills they should be getting, who should be accrediting them. These are really a big problem. Uh, and if we want to look at countries who do it well, or if we draw on those that what we know, Canada does it very, very well. And because they go across a whole range of different policies, it's not just about only supply side or only employer side. It's about a whole range of a eco business system and infrastructure of how governments coordinate with business and unions and employee representatives and other civil society organizations to say, we want to move our society forward in this positive way to achieve this together. That's how they are more successful than we are and what we've done in the past and how we've dealt with previous crises. So I think we really need that a coalition of people who come together to deliver that message about what we do to bring everybody forward together. That's really, really essential. Sorry, that was a political party broadcast for some party. <laughs> <laughs> party broadcast as well. I think there's strong cross-party support for doing something that um, that involves different partners and focuses on future work and future planning. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why we pulled the former Future of Work Commission together. Um, I think that we have come to the end of our uh, session and I'm going to need to hand over to Nayasha. We've had some, that's been fantastic. Thank you all for your different perspectives. It's really important to have different perspectives. There've been some common themes, but they've also been variations um, and a lot of questions and some excellent questions, which I hope Nayasha we can hang on to as we move across to the question and answer session in a bit. Thank you. Great. I know that there's a huge store of questions online and also that there will be lots wanting to hear more from Chris, Daniel and Jackie about the lump of labour fallacy and what governments can do to ensure a fair working environment for those in the UK and other countries. Um, so I would encourage everybody to get a cup of coffee, do what you need to do. And then if you have the sign in code to see us back here in 13 minutes for a Q&A with the panelists. That was a really excellent session. So thank you everybody for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.